Take your Bibles and turn to First Peter chapter number three, and we'll do some studying this evening. I think we'll kind of back down this evening a little bit, and uh, we'll just go on and study our Bibles. First Peter chapter number three, and uh, we'll see what we can cover as far as the material uh, that I've got here uh, in First Peter chapter three. I've got some stuff for you as far as an outline. Maybe we'll put it on you. Maybe we won't. Uh, we, I'll break it down, I guess, uh, somewhere through the lesson. Let's have some word of prayer now before we go any further. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we just call upon you, Lord, and seek your face in all that we do. I pray, Lord, you take my tongue, Lord, to loosen it. I pray, Lord, you make me speak clearly. I pray, Lord, you'd help me to be a blessing to these people, not a curse. Lord, help me to steer them straight and edify them from the word of God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Okay, I, uh, this thing here I got as far as notes uh, speaks about lovely living. And this thing here is uh, basically verses 1 to 7 has to do with a lovely home. In uh, verse number 10, it speaks about a lovely life, loving life there, lovely life. In verse number 18, it speaks about a lovely Lord. And then in verse number 22, it speaks about a lovely land. And uh, that makes it some pretty good living. <laughs> you know, if you're, uh, if you're here and you're saved, uh, you can live with love. Uh, if you keep, get your home life in order, what that thing's supposed to be, you'll have a lovely life while you're here. Uh, if you have your personal life in order, you'll have a lovely life while you're here. If, you, uh, if you're saved and trusting Jesus Christ as your Savior, the just for the unjust, uh, if you're trusting Him while well, you have a lovely life, are uh, redeemed by the blood. And, of course, love to live is being in subjection to authority. And I guess one of the hardest things you do is to be in subjection to authority, and yet it makes for a good life. So good for you to learn that real early in your life. All right, First Peter chapter 3 now, and verse number 1. The Bible says, Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. All right, likewise. Well, all right, then something uh, you read before that, previous to that, just about like that. Uh, that is in chapter 2 and verse number 13, the Christians were told uh, to submit to rulers. Uh, in verse number 13, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be the king of supreme, unto governors, and unto, unto them that are sent by him uh, for the punishment of evildoers, and for them that, for the praise of them that do well. All right? You're supposed to, every Christian is supposed to be in obedience to the rulers as long as they don't cross the word of God. All right, then also, likewise, includes servants and master relationship. And that'll be in about verse number 18. The Bible says, Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only the good and gentle, but also to the forward. All right? And just as Christians are supposed to be sub, uh, in submission, subjection, uh, to the authority that's over them, the rulers that are over them, uh, and servants are supposed to be in subjection unto the masters, likewise, ye wives are supposed to be in subjection to your own husbands. Now, you want to remember that. A lot of times, they don't have any problem being in subjection to others. Go out and work a job and... Boss man says, you know, how about doing this for me? See, I'll be glad to do it. And, uh, how about doing this for me? I'll be glad to do it. And they smile and do it gladly. But it comes time to be in subjection to their own husbands. That's where the problem always lies. Well, go on and do it yourself. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, you, you're not crippled. Your hand's not broke. Go on and get that ice cream yourself. And it says, be in subjection to your own husbands. And it says, why? Reason why? That if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wise. All right, then you deal with a situation there that uh, could be actually dealing with the saved person. I mean, suppose you got a situation where the husband's saved and the wife's saved, and yet that husband, he's not going by the word of God. Uh, that fellow, he's, uh, he's messing up. He's not doing right. He knows he's not doing right. His wife knows he's not doing right. A lot of other folks know he's not doing right that uh, uh, perhaps nobody would even suspect. But anyhow, uh, the Bible says, if they obey not the word, they may also without the word be one. All right, then one to what? One of the Lord Jesus Christ? No, that's not it. It says if they obey not the word, then the winning has to do with winning them to obedience to the word of God. If any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won uh, by the conversation of the wives. Well, then when a woman's going to try and get her husband straightened up, uh, she can't do it by browbeating him with the word of God. You know, a lot of women that go off and memorize a few verses and they get some idea that they can come on in and show their husband everything they know. And boy, they're going to preach to him. They're going to put it on him. And he's going to say, get out in the kitchen, mama, and scrub those pots and pans. I don't want to hear it. And, you know, a man will never submit to having a woman uh, have an authority over him. She's just not going to do it. Uh, he's not going to do it. And if that woman, I don't care if she knows more about than what he knows, that's not the way you work a thing. Ladies, if you want to work on those men, and they're disobedient to the word of God, you want to work on them, then you're going to have to win them without the word. You say, Brother Mark, you tell me not to put out the word. That book's got some authority. And you start putting the word of God on them, and right away you're going to have your battle. I mean, you put a verse on them, they know they got coming. All of a sudden, brother, inside, they're going to rear up, and they're going to think about three of them put on you. <laughs> and uh, you come back with another, and they're going to come back about ten on top of you. And they're going to fight that authority all the way, and they never will submit to the authority of a woman. And if you're going to get them in obedience to the word of God, I don't care if they're saved, you're going to get them to obey the word of God, you're going to have to win them without the word of God. They're just too much authority in this book. <laughs> Haven't you ever found that out? 
You find that all the time. I find that all the time. They don't like that. They don't like the authority of the Word of God. So as a result, they change it. They add to it. They subtract from it. They take something. They put a question mark around. Do something to the Word of God. Get this authority away from me. <laughs> and uh, a husband will do the same thing to you. I don't care if it's King James Bible believer. Whenever they grow cold, uh, I mean, they get hard and hard. And they get mean. They get nasty. And God's dealing with them. They can't live with themselves. And all you got to do is come on, man. You just put one, you know, stack one on top of them. Man, I mean, that's just enough to blow the cork. That'll do it. But if you want to win them, what you do is you win them to obedience to the word of God. It says they also may, without the word, be won by the conversation of the wise. Then plain words you say, Brother Martin, I should say something, but never use scripture. No, I'm not even saying that. In the Bible, conversation goes two ways. Uh, example, look at verse number two. It says, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. All right, in plainer words, uh, it's a situation where your conversation, what you do in your manner of life is so clear and so clean and so pure, that thing just totally disarms them. And when they see a situation like that, I mean, they can't handle that type of thing. But they can handle everything else you can throw at them. They can handle, I don't care what arguments you got. I don't care how much scripture you put on. They can handle that thing. And they'll come back with twice as much. They'll never receive that. But if you just come simply through with a life that's pure and above reproach, I mean, you'll unhinge them. You'll disarm them. They won't have any comeback. And that thing says, while well, they behold your chaste conversation. Then in plainer words, conversation is naturally what we say. But also, according to the word of God, it's what they see. And what they see speaks, as far as that lady's concerned, that thing is more in effect, and do more effect to them uh, than in, even the Word of God. And the Bible says, a uh, chase conversation coupled with fear. All right, then your one, two punches, your life is be clear, uh, pure, above reproach, chase conversation. That has to do with purity. All right, your, your life is supposed to be pure, and then the one, two punch is and come on back that thing with a bunch of scripture and bam, and slam them like that. I mean, the one, two punches coupled with fear. You say, oh, afraid of, well, I want you to, you know, I'm afraid of you. Huh? No, not that. It's being afraid of God. It's the fear of the Lord. Uh, you come on down a little bit further in the chapter and he gets talking about the thing. And that's exactly what the Lord wants you to show as far as your husband's concerned. If you have a husband who's disobedient to the word of God, that's the way you turn him back to the word of God, back to obedience to the word of God, is by your chaste conversation and coupled with fear. Uh, take your Bible, go to Galatians chapter 1. You find a situation back there where uh, Paul gets talking about his conversation. And you can understand that it doesn't have to do with just what he says. He talks about making havoc of the church and persecuting the church there. It's Galatians 1 and verse number 13. Uh, Galatians 1 and verse number 13. It says, For you've heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, and notice what it consists of, how beyond measure I persecuted the church of God. You mean just with words? No, he breathed out threatenings and slaughter against the, against the disciples of the Lord. But it wasn't that. It says, uh, I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. And uh, he laid that thing waste, man. He just tore up. He hailed men and women. He made havoc of the church according to the word of God. And prophet of the Jews' religion above many mine equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. And so in a situation like that, his conversation consisted of more than just what he said. It consisted of taking that church and just tearing that place apart. So what you want to do, uh, ma'am, is what you want to do as far as getting your uh, household in order is to just lay low and keep your life, I mean, pure. I mean, so pure that every aspect of your life, they can just see that thing. There's no comeback. There's no reproach. I mean, there's no way they can even come back and bring any reproach upon you. Everything is absolutely clear. And top that thing off with just fear in God. Not your husband now, but fear in God. And I'll tell you what, you've got a winning combination according to the word of God. Now, verse number three, it says, who's adorning? Now, this has to do with what you wear. Who's adorning? Let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold or putting on of apparel. Now, it's kind of a thing whereby it's uh, uh, adorning. Uh, that's sometimes going even more than what's required. Now, I'm not for somebody just letting themselves go. I wouldn't do it as a man. I don't believe in uh, letting a person dissipate. Lost people sometimes. Uh, I got a fellow that I know is in his 60s, and he says, I never will let myself dissipate. I don't even know what the guy is saved, yet he's got some sense about him. And I'm not for Christians just letting themselves go, just, you know, uh, letting the hair down look like a hippie or something like that, and uh, just uh, going on and not dressing neat, not dressing right. I don't believe in that kind of stuff. I believe a person needs to be as careful as they can, but it says that there's some things that uh, are not going to affect your husband, and just excessive adornment, that's not going to do it. It says, who's adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair. Now, he's not talking about putting some kind of a gold plate on it, silver plate on it, 
or something like that. And he's talking about plating, has to do with folding in, uh, braiding, twisting, that sort of thing. Adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold. That don't mean anything. I mean, as far as that husband's concerned, what he's looking after, he's looking for somebody who's pure. He's looking for somebody who's clean. He's looking for somebody who fears God. And the gold you can forget. And the Bible says gold or putting on of apparel. It says, but let it be the hidden man of the heart and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. All right, then uh, take your Bible and go to 1 Timothy chapter number 2. And notice once again about the apparel. 1 Timothy chapter number 2. Uh, Brother John Manley asked me, he said, I got a friend of my mother's that comes to the house sometimes on the weekends and uh, says she's, uh, she doesn't have a dress, she wears slacks, can she come to church? I said, well, yeah, she can come to church as long as uh, I don't fuss much about that kind of stuff. Uh, I, like to see, uh, I like to see ladies in dresses. I always think they look much better in dresses. And I wish ladies would wear them every day of the week, all the time, at home, in church, etc. and so on. Uh, but I realize that's kind of something you've got to be sort of charitable about. Uh, but nonetheless, as far as church is concerned, our lady's been real good. I think about two years ago, uh, they used to complain we first moved out to the church house here. It was three years ago. Church building was too cold and they began to wear slacks. And I noticed that women never wore slacks before, began to wear slacks to church. So the next year, I just sort of nipped that thing in the bud. And in October, I said, now, this year we're going to keep the church real warm. We're not going to keep it at 70. We're going to keep it at 72. It's going to be more than adequate for you. You won't have to wear your slacks anymore. <laughs> and I says, I'm going to announce this thing. Uh, every Sunday for a month, and that way you know I'm not picking on any one particular person. And I did that, and I think since that time, I don't know if I've ever seen anybody wear a pair of slacks in this church since that time as far as our church ladies are concerned. And I realize that sort of thing. You need to be a little bit on the charitable side about it. Uh, those more particular convictions, I think the more ladylike you look, the more ladylike you get treated. And uh, the Bible speaks about women being dainty and that sort of thing, and not sensuous, dainty type of women uh, back in the Old Testament. And uh, that's the things that adorn a woman. A woman, that's what a man is looking for. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 9. It says, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel. And the problem is sometimes their adorning is uh, excess and above that which is needed. And, of course, you see in the last part of the verse, it says, Not with broided hair, gold, pearls, or costly array once again. Often uh, there's no need to wear that kind of stuff. I mean, adorn yourselves. Take care of what you, uh, take care of yourself best as what you can. Make yourself look uh, as nice as what you can. Uh, but it's not a matter of the excessive uh, array that you put on that means anything as far as that husband's concerned. All right? Uh, women adorn themselves in modest apparel and says with shamefacedness. It's a situation that they've got a face as though they were ashamed to display the flesh. That's exactly what uh, shamefacedness is. Uh, to display the flesh is a shame to them, and they've got a face that shows it's a shame to them. And when they're not dressed properly, I mean, you know, it's real good to see people still be able to blush, isn't it? But these days, I mean, from the time they're a kid, they're running around in shorts, and so when they get older, it doesn't mean anything to them. And when they're 16 years of age, they display their bodies, man, with hardly anything on them, and they don't even go around shamefacing us doing that. So you better be, be very careful now as far as your daughters are concerned, or you're going to have a time and a half trying to undo that thing uh, later on. And then verse number 10, it says, But which becometh women professing godliness with good works. All right, back to 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 4. Now you got the apparel. Uh, you got the, uh, the purity there. You got the uh, winning them without the word of God. You can't browbeat them with the word of God. Then verse number four, it says, let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. Now, I know anything I say from here on out is going to cause trouble. <laughs> you can't argue with God now. But I know you can argue with your pastor. Well, go and argue with me. I don't care. You'll probably do it again sometime anyhow. Uh, but anyhow, that thing there says an ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. Now, you'll have something to deck yourself out with. I mean, that's something that, that's something there if you had a problem in your home. There's something there to do the job. I mean, I have people come to me all the time with one problem and another problem. Husbands, wives, and back and forth. And I mean, there's all kinds of problems out there. There are problems in our church family. There's problems outside our church family. There's problems in my family. There's problems here and there and everywhere. I mean, there's always a one problem or another. If you don't have problems, the devil sees you have some before too long. But I'll tell you one way you can overcome a lot of it. And that's the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. Uh, don't they say silence is golden? 
Well, according to the word of God, it says, which is in the sight of God of great price. You know, if you learn to keep your mouth shut, it'd, it'd do you good. It'd do you good. I'm sure your husband appreciate it. <laughs> I get a kick out of some of those stories Dr. Ruckman tells, you know. <laughs> he tells stories about women. Yeah, bah, 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 you know, like that. You know. Shut up! You know, and man, let somebody else talk once in a while. I never forget one time I was in a situation. And I forget uh, exactly what that situation consisted of now. But I remember one time, and you know, I hear ladies talking all the time. And, and uh, these ladies, they were talking. And I'm telling you, and I guess in about 20, 30 minutes, I mean, I heard one situation, you know, you know, without even listening to conversation, without even eavesdropping on anything, I mean, one person has a tone of voice that's, you know, up here, another one's down here, another one's down here, and so you can pretty well know who's doing the talking. <laughs> I'm not a kidding you, in about 20, 30 minutes, I mean, I heard about 98% of, yuck, 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 I mean, for 20 minutes, 30 minutes straight, you know, I mean, it was just that sort of thing. And the other party come back, and I'm sure the man there ear was getting bent, you know, and flopping over like that, you know, poor old cocker spaniel or something, you know, and say, well, praise the Lord, glory to God. What else you want me to say to you? Glory to God. <laughs> yeah. But uh, honestly, sometimes, I mean, silence is golden. It's worth something. It's worth something. It'll do you good to learn to just shut up and sometimes be an ear. You know, sometimes I have to be an ear. People come in, they got some problems, I get them talking right off. Uh, I mean, they don't need to hear me talk. I mean, i got to hear them talk before I even know what to say. I said, well, what's your problem? They come in, you know, uh, 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 uh. I said, what's your problem? I just get them talking, let them talk, and I listen. And you know, sometimes i got to listen for 5, 10, 15 minutes. And i got to listen. If I'm going to help them out, I've got to listen. And some of you all, I mean, it would do you good to learn to be an ear also. And learn to be a listener. And you women, that thing's in the sight of God of great price. I mean, how are you ever going to keep your home just... Nice, and peaceable, and quiet. I mean, how are you ever going to keep it that way if you can't learn to shut up? You never do it. You never do it. I'll take your Bible now and go back to Proverbs chapter number 31. Proverbs chapter 31. and I'll look at verse number 10. Proverbs 31 and verse number 10. In verse number 10 says, Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. Her price is far above rubies. And name some virtues down through there. Now this woman here, she's a woman that's not lazy. She's a lady that she'll work with her hands. Uh, you can see all down through there. If you just take and underline the word hands, you'd find it down there four, five, six times. She's not afraid to work. She'll get out there and she'll do something with her hands. She's not somebody that's lazy, not afraid to get up. She gets up early in the morning while it's still dark. She's not afraid of the snow for her household. Uh, she's already done taking care of that. The clothing's already made. Winter time's coming on, but that doesn't make any difference. Everything's all set and everything's real good. And the Bible says uh, her price is far above rubies. And you know, a lot of times, uh, in fact, I look at the first thing right there. The heart of her husband does safely trust in her. A lot of times I face situations and I say, uh, somebody's, you know, having a hard time in a home situation. And I say to him, I say, well, I say, what about your wife? I say, can she be trusted? Oh, yeah, yeah, the problem's not her, the problem's me. I say, well, I say, friend, you can do a whole lot worse, worse than what you got then. According to God, God takes a woman like that. Number one, if you can even trust her safely in your heart. You got you somebody that, as far as God's concerned, her price is far above rubies. Amen. You take old Liz Taylor, she comes on at a price. Those guys that courted her and dated her, I mean, it cost them some money. I read about some pearl, some something they had, uh, some big old pearl, costly pearl. Uh, they called that thing the pearl of great price. And when she was going with that fellow named Burton, Burton bought that thing for it. And he think what he paid for it. And uh, she comes at a price. But I'll tell you something, you can take everything she's got stashed away and everything she wears around her neck and everything else she's got coming and going, and you can have it. I'll take one that I can trust in. Amen. I like one whenever I go off to work, I don't have to think twice about them. I, I kiss them goodbye and I don't have to worry about them until I come back and kiss them good uh, day and uh, good evening when I come back through again. <laughs> I like that kind. And I know you do too. And if you got one like that, you better appreciate her. If you got one like that that's, that's, uh, uh, that's trustworthy and somebody that you don't have to worry about, I mean, you better praise God for her, and you better never quit praising God for her, and you better treat her like she really means something to you and like she's worth something to you. You better treat her like she's supposed to be treated. And I'm not a kidding you, because there aren't too many of them around. You ever see some of them Gallup polls? There's a lot of foolishness out there, fellas. There's a lot of horrible wickedness 
out there. And if you got one that you can trust, you better praise the Lord every day you live for that. You better praise God from whom all blessings flow for dumping out a blessing upon you that, brother, many of them don't have out there. You better be thankful for that. Amen. And you better show her that you're thankful. And then if you've got one that's like that and somebody that's not lazy, I mean, if you can trust her and on top of that she's not lazy, then you've really got you something. <laughs> and you got you one man, her price is far above rubies. And if you got one that's, I mean, uh, that's trustworthy and not lazy, and one knows how to keep her mouth shut, <laughs> man, you got one that's not just worth above, uh, far above rubies, she's worth more than gold. <laughs> I mean, you couldn't buy one like that. That's a jewel. That's what you call a jewel. And ladies, if I wasn't a jewel here tonight, I'd come in with the Lord that I was going to be a jewel hereafter and forevermore. I'd take whatever God put upon me from his word. I'd take and I'd listen to it. I'd listen to it. I don't care how tough your husband is. I don't care how hard of a nut he is. They can be cracked. And this is the way you crack them. You can work them over, but you can't work them over with the word of God. And you can't work them over with these things here. They're going to be stronger than what you are. And you have to work them over from a very different angle. Just like the word of God says. Now, some of them situations, maybe you married in a bad situation. Don't expect it to be undone overnight. I expect you to get right. You can take these things and turn around right now. And from henceforth, do what God tells you to do. But you know, it may take a while. You know, the husband may go along and he's going to be used to something coming through that uh, uh, when he's uh, when it doesn't come through that way, it's going to take him by surprise. Well, I wonder what happened. <laughs> but he won't catch on. And so you just keep on living right and keep living a godly life and Showing him that you fear God more than you fear him. And showing him that Lord Jesus Christ means more to you than anything else. Your home, your family, and anything else and everything put together. And he well, I wonder what happened to her. But uh, he won't think too much about it. And it's going to take a while before he catches on. Then when he catches on, he's going to be watching every move you make. He's going to watch how you tie your shoes. He's going to watch whether uh, how your hair is combed. He's going to watch whether your teeth are brushed. He's going to watch, I mean, he'll watch every move you make. And that's your chance. Because the closer he watches, the greater opportunity you got. And if you want to get some things straightened around, that's exactly the way you do it. Now, as well as uh, being quiet as far as this thing's concerned, that thing says the order of a meek and quiet spirit. And a quiet spirit is a kind of a spirit that's not troubled over everything. It doesn't get all rattled over every little thing all the time. Uh, it's the type of thing that, I mean, it's, it's settled in the Lord. It's trust in God. And uh, as a result, I mean, things may come and things may go. And you have the valleys and you have the bills that can't be paid. And you wonder how you're going to get them paid. Instead of get them all, getting all frustrated about it and get all nervous about the thing. And get everybody else nervous and get the husband nervous and the kids all nervous. And the whole household upset about the thing. Uh, you just keep right on going through. Just pray and just trust in God. Just day after day after day. Just keep on trusting God. And says the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. Husbands. If you got somebody that even closely resembles, uh, remotely resembles something like this, you better be a very outstanding and gracious husband to a woman like that, and you better praise the Lord for what you got. Verse number 5 says, For after this man in the old time the holy women also, who trust in God, adorn themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. Now, if you want to really throw him off the boards, try that one. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, they'll... <laughs> I don't believe I could handle that one. I wouldn't. Uh, I think my wife's ready for the cuckoo house or something. But uh, uh, Lord, you know, I mean, like Master, Mister, Sir, uh, try it sometime. You call him everything else. Try, try putting something like. Try going the other route. Try going from this end of the pole up to this end of the pole and put something on them, man. I mean, they'll fall for it. I mean, they're, they're suckers, you know. They'll say, oh, oh, yeah, they'll believe what you say, and you know, everybody likes to hear good things about themselves, so they probably even fall for it. Uh, you take Sarah back there. Take your Bibles. Go back to Genesis chapter 18. Look at verse number 12. Genesis chapter 18 and verse number 12. Uh, Sarah, the Bible says she called him Lord. But uh, Yeah, here we go, verse 12. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also. And uh, it's sort of a thing she sort of said within herself, but nonetheless it shows you her feelings towards her husband. And I like, uh, I appreciate situations where 
uh, people can have fun. I enjoy kidding myself. I enjoy having a whole lot of fun and having a good time. Uh, I like to get around young people and kids just for that particular purpose. They don't have the burdens that older people have upon them, and uh, they can have a lot of fun. And I realize we're to bear one of those burdens, uh, but sometimes, you know, it does you good just to get around where somebody doesn't have any burdens, and somebody just has a lot of fun. I enjoy young couples to have a lot of fun. I enjoy young couples who can kid with each other and fool with each other and uh, clown around with each other and uh, laugh with each other. I enjoy being around people like that. I really do. But you know what I'm always afraid of? I'm always afraid of whenever they get kidding too much, they begin to jab at each other and, you know, they begin cutting each other. And I always realize that somewhere down the road, somebody's going to get hurt. I'm always afraid of that. Every time I see it, every time I see where, I mean, that woman just cuts that fellow down and, you know, around everybody, he laughs and everybody else laughs. And it's sort of funny. And so you laugh. It's probably true, you know, but that cut, you know, and uh, it just never does quite work out. Every time I've known, I've known two real serious situations like that. And both those situations wound up with two very serious uh, marital problems. And it just don't work. And so you'd be wise if you keep the cutting down and uh, matter of fact keep it clear out and uh, treat him like he's something after all if he's putting the bread on the table uh, he's the father of your children and uh, if he's uh, got a roof over top of your head and you got uh, uh, clothes and uh, you got food and you got raiment uh, you need to be content with the things you have and uh, uh, you need to treat him with respect and show him that you respect him and you're thankful to the Lord that you've got someone like him it says whose daughters ye are as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement. You know, some women, they get nervous over every little thing. And uh, they get nervous if they're going to have a baby. Uh, they get nervous if they don't have enough money. Uh, there are some, you got some women, they're afraid to have babies. I remember one time a fellow, he got married. And I said, well, man, uh, when are you going to start replenishing the earth? <laughs> and this fellow, his wife, uh, uh, she was afraid to bought the Battle of Armageddon. And he was afraid to have kids because of the Battle of Armageddon. Well, I read my Bible back in Genesis chapter number 5, Enoch, I mean, for the translation. And that fellow, he was bearing children, bearing children, bearing children, and God holed him up. I wasn't worried about Armageddon, and I'm not worried about it either. I'm not going to be around. I don't like the world we've got to raise our kids in. I don't like it at all. I don't like where my boy's at. That upsets me. That bothers me. I can't even get close to that place, man. That throws me clear off the boards. I mean, I go up to get a man. I mean, I'm rejoicing in God. Two and a half hours sleep, man. God's giving good lessons over at Maslin. I'm rejoicing in God, having a good time in the Lord. Enjoying the orange trees, the red trees, the golden trees, the green trees, and everything else in between there. I mean, just enjoying, I mean, the beautiful scenery the Lord has painted, man. Day after day, he changed that thing. And I think old Brother Pete up here painting this picture here, man, slopping it everywhere. And he ain't going to learn off me because he slops away, man. This don't work. Try something else. This don't work. Try something else. He's slopping it everywhere. I mean, this wall and that wall. Y'all see this wall back here. <laughs> it got something too. And uh, I can't, I could never believe that he'd paint that picture in three days. And when his wife told me he wasn't coming in until four o'clock in the afternoon, I said, well, isn't he going to paint the baptistry? Uh, she said, why aren't you going to paint the baptistry? He said, yeah. But I said, if I got up early, I wouldn't feel like painting anyhow. I'll paint afterwards. <laughs> and I thought, well, he'd paint about half of it. Leave us in a mess and probably say, I'll be back in six months. I will get him again in two years <laughs> to finish up the painting. And he painted it three days. But you know, he can't come close to the Lord. The Lord takes something, man, and change it every day. I mean, you go out, man, the trees just a little bit more gold, a little bit more beautiful, a little bit. I mean, they ain't nobody like the Lord. I mean, the Lord, I, he's something else. I mean, I just enjoy the Lord. But you know, I got up there before I ever got to his room. I felt like I was surrounded with music that I can't handle. And I'm not around that kind of music, and I can't handle it. There's just something about that thing. I, it does me what it did to Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 3, verse number 13. And you can read your Bible and find out what that is. But I get around that thing and immediately something inside of me begins to boil and curdle. And I mean, the, the old pot of ointment begins to boil there and I just cannot handle it. And I got up to that uh, floor where he was at and I'll tell you what, uh, my countenance fell. I'll be right frank with you, my countenance fell. And I had a rough weekend. I had a rough weekend. I did lots of praying. And I found myself in a situation that I, I didn't like and there I am sitting helplessly by and can't do anything about it. And I mean, you feel like kicking windows out. You feel like kicking pulpit over. You feel like kicking the table over. You feel like uh, the Lord Jesus Christ in John chapter number 2. And I don't know whether it's righteous indignation or the flesh, one of the two. Uh, but I'll tell you, it'll about get to you. It'll about get to you. And uh, so I'm not worried about Armageddon. I'm enjoying the Lord right now. And I'm going to enjoy the Lord until the translation. I'm going to enjoy the kids I've already got. <laughs> As far as that's concerned. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, I don't see as it's anything particular to worry about. I don't like the world in which we live. Uh, but you can still train them up in the way they should go. And if you give them something to come...
And ladies, don't you worry about every little thing. Some of y'all are going to turn your hair gray. My mother-in-law, she, she sits around and thinks about what she can worry about. <laughs> I mean, she's up in the hospital thinking about it. Brian was over to the house when we called, when she called, when they called early Thursday morning. And uh, Brian was at, the, uh, was at our house. And so Shirley and I, we, uh, well, I was already gone. But anyhow, I come back home. And she said, we got to go to the hospital. I take your mom to the hospital. And she said, what do I do with Brian? And I said, well, uh, she thought I was going to sit there and watch him, you know, run wild in the hospital. I'm going to try and, you know, just sit there and control that. I said, we'll take him right back home to his mama. We get to the hospital. Mom Gillespie's back in the emergency room. And she's worrying about maybe we left Brian at home by himself. <laughs> Well, Mom, you know that they wouldn't do that. And Jeannie says, you know they know better than that. Well, yeah, but maybe they got real nervous and get left in a hurry and forgot Brian. <laughs> and she just lays around thinking about what she can worry about. And some of you all just as bad. Some of you ladies are going to sit around and you're, going, you're just going to fret and your hair's going to turn gray and you're going to worry about the money, you're going to worry about your husband's job, you're going to worry about the kids, you're going to worry about one. You better start getting the victory in the Lord. And you better learn that your victories are in Him and you better keep victory in the Lord Jesus Christ 95% of the time and not let that other stuff uh, undo you. That thing says, as long as you do well and are not afraid with any uh, amazement. And so, uh, women, you need to be very careful about the situation. Uh, verse number 7 says, Likewise, ye husbands, uh, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, as being heirs together the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. All right, then, what you have, you're going to have a lovely life. You're going to have to have a lovely home. And it's going to take two sides to the coin. It's never enough, and I realize what you're dealing with here. I have seven verses, six of them dealing with the women. So there's no way I can uh, stand around and talk for as long on the husbands what I did on the men. Aren't you fellas glad about that? <laughs> you ladies think I'm prejudiced? You try it. I mean, one verse against six. There's more to say in six than there is in one. But there are some things to say. And there's some important things to say. And there's some things to say that's going to make that home a touch of heaven on this earth. And if you fellas don't get that thing in order, ain't no way you can have the best wife in the world. Ain't no way your house is going to come through right. Don't expect it to. All right, what's it say? It says, likewise, you husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge. It says, giving honor unto the wife is under the weaker vessel. All right, then number one, you dwell with them according to knowledge. All right, you're supposed to know something about that woman. What are you supposed to know? Well, the Bible says back in Ephesians chapter number 5, it says you're the Savior of her body. You're not the Savior of her soul. You're the Savior of her body. And so you're supposed to know some things about that woman's body. Or the Bible says you're supposed to see that body's nourished. You're supposed to see that she's cherished. You're supposed to take care of that woman's body. You're the Savior of her body. Now, if that's true, then her body is not just an object for your lust. Now remember that. And so you're supposed to be very careful. There's some things you're supposed to know about females, about women, especially your wife, that I can't discuss with you in a class like this, in a study like this. There are some things that you talk over with your doctor, and you don't go talking them over in a Sunday school class. Everybody wants to get out of all the garbage. You know, back in Leviticus, what does this mean back here? You know what it means back there. There are some things, as far as this Word of God is concerned, are for private reading. Your own reading in your own home between you and her or maybe a doctor, but you better know about them. Better find out about them. Dwell with them according to knowledge. Do you realize every time that woman has a baby, something goes out of her body? Do you realize when she has a baby, there's some strength that goes out of that woman's body? Do you realize that you're going to have to see she gets properly fed and get some vitamins and get some nourishment back in that body? You realize you can't just make an old washed woman out of her. She'll never be anything for you if that's all, the only way you treat her. She ought to be more than that to you. It says, give an honor unto the wife. Give them honor. You want them to, uh, to call you Lord? The Bible says in Ephesians 5 and verse number 33, it says, give her reverence. Nevertheless, let the wife give reverence unto her own husband. Uh, if you want her to call you Lord, call you Mr., call you Sir, at least in her heart, at least treat you with respect, you've got to give her a reason why to treat you with respect. I mean, you've got to give her some reason to think well of you. I mean, she's not going to take an old ungodly reprobate and feel like calling him Lord. She's not going to take somebody who doesn't give her any honor and feel like giving him any honor. So you've got to dwell from according to knowledge and give honor unto the wife. You know, before a fellow gets married, he goes out there and he opens that car door up and he's real careful, you know, and he helps her in and he closes that door back up and 
He waits till she's all ruffled together, you know, and gets her coat in and her dress in and closes the door back up. And he walks back around there and gets in and he starts that old car engine up, you know, and he turns out the perfume lid, you know, and odors up the place. <laughs> I mean, he really lays the thing on thick and heavy. And, you know, after they get married, you need to do the same thing. I like it where they don't ever lose, uh, they don't ever lose that love for each other. I love to see childish things done by husband and wife. I love to see those women just treated like a million dollars. I like to see that that husband given honor unto that wife. She's a good woman. Lord's blessed me. And the Lord's been good to me. Give me a wife like that. I don't deserve a wife like that. I don't deserve a woman like that. I mean, man, I'm no good. God's given me a wife like that. Man, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. Man, the Lord's been good to me. That thing says, you husbands dwell from court knowledge, giving honor unto the wife. How you been treating her? I've been treating her like she's a scum of the earth. Been treating her like she's a filthy off scarring of the world. How you been treating her? What about it? Been giving any honor unto her? Been showing her that you really appreciate the blessing God's given you and giving you a wife like that? I mean, that Bible says, Whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing. Amen. Ron, you want to preach on that a while? <laughs> and honestly, the Lord's been real good to you now. The Lord showed some favor unto you according to the Word of God. And giving you a woman. If you got a Christian woman, you got one who loves God and loves you and loves the kids, you got you something, man. You really got you something. And you better give her some honor. And you better go the second mile of the way for her. And you better take her out. When you got a dollar in your pocket, take her on out and buy her the hamburger. Spend a dollar. And don't worry about it. Just be thankful you got a woman like that. And uh, give some honor unto her. Bring her something home. Bring her bring a little gift home from, uh, oh, maybe the drugstore, maybe uh, the candy store. Uh, bring them something like that. I mean, give some honor unto them. Uh, treat them like you used to before you married them. I mean, uh, uh, open the car door for her once in a while. I mean, uh, at least give her some honor. Give that woman some honor. She can use it. She'll appreciate it. It'll mean a lot more to, uh, to her than what you really think. I mean, a man, that stuff doesn't mean much to him. He's used to being knocked around at work all the time, knocked around the basketball court and the gym floor and uh, the football field. So he's used to taking some knocks. I mean, to him, that's just a way of life, man. If you don't get beat up and knocked around a few times, I mean, uh, something's wrong, something bad wrong. I, mean, I can't hardly handle it. <laughs> but a woman's not that way. A woman's not made up that way. A woman likes that honor. And you give that woman some honor, and I'll tell you what, she's going she's gonna to come back, and you come home about a day later, and you're going to find you some cookies there. And you give her some more honor. Say, honey, you're the sweetest thing I ever knew. <laughs> you sure are sweet. Ah, oh, you're lovely. You're sweet. Nothing sweeter than you except Jesus. I mean, you sure are good. And uh, you give her some honor, and I'll tell you what. Uh, you come home about a couple days after that, and you're going to come through there, and you open that garage door, and you're going to be staggering around. What is it? Let me in there. Let me out. <laughs> you open that door, man, and go in there. Where, where's that? Still in the oven. Still baking. Open that oven up, man. Clean out the door. Get that hot loaf of bread and take that butter and spread that thing all over there. Get some peanut butter and some honey and honey. Make yourself sick, devouring that stuff on the belly. And, stuff, and, stuff, and, stuff. and uh, it'll work that way. You watch and see. You watch and see. You know why you think I'm crazy? And I know you do. Because you ain't never tried it. You ain't never tried it. It'll work. It'll work. You know, whenever I think about a lovely home, I think about some of the families in our church, and I think about some of the ones that treat their wives. I mean, they go the second mile away for them. They're so nice to them, and so uh, they're just so gracious to them, so gentle to them, and they give them all the honor in the world. And honestly, I, I hope they never lose it. Hope they never lose it. You know, over there at Emmerich's house, uh, somebody told me one time, says they're crazy. <laughs> and Brislin, he went over there one time, and and. Uh, he sat around, he says, they're crazy over there, he told me. <laughs> I don't know what he's doing going around calling people crazy, but uh, that was his words. <laughs> but uh, a couple weeks ago, he was out knocking on doors, and uh, was just the only four of us came out that day, and it was me and Ron was knocking on doors, and Jeannie and Willie. And uh, we had this thing going, so we thought we'd better stay close to the women, you know, make sure everything's on, above board and what, keep a good eye on them. And so we had it where, you know, they'd hit one door, and we'd hit the next, and when they'd hit the next, we'd hit the next. <laughs> and I couldn't believe it. we'd be talking to somebody, and they'd close the door on us, we'd go down the street, and we'd see them two doors down. <laughs> And I, I, we couldn't do did you get that house already and they said no we're leaving that for you and we just, man we was confused so sometimes they got and sometimes they went down and left it for us and we'd have to go down to where they is at and say did you get that and no you <laughs> and we'd have to go back up there and go knock on that door it was wild you know and then every so often ronnie would have to stop and say how's it going willie how's it talking going because you know sometimes they get talking to willie and she just she don't know what to say <laughs> and then he'd say how's it going joining and i hmm, wonder what that is 
And then uh, we'd get up to a couple houses up the street, you know, and he'd say, well, how's it going out there, Johnny? Get any chances to witness? And we got to the car and I says, I thought her name was Jeannie or is it Joni? Oh, he says, that's just something we do over at the house. He says, we go around talking baby talk. <laughs> he says, we go around and call Jeannie. We call her Joyny. And, and uh, Willie tells me to go to the story, you know, uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, a bunch of baby talk. And it just sort of kind of comes out sometimes. You know what I say? I love it, man. I love it. I love it. I love it. I really do. That's crazy, isn't it? Amen. Y'all try. Y'all try. <laughs> That's the craziest thing I've ever heard of. <laughs> That crazy Ron Emmerich. <laughs> you know, it's no wonder they're so happy. It's no wonder. And she gives honor unto him, and he gives honor unto her. And I mean, I see her driving around all the time. She chauffeurs him around. <laughs> and that's something. I mean, I see him going down the road, you know, and there's Willie. You know, she just she just driving that little old car, and I get up behind him trying to read the bumper sticker. I'm about to shove him down the road someday. You know? <laughs> and old Ron, he's just sitting there about half asleep, you know, going on to school. But I'm sure there's times when he does the drive, and I'm sure there's times whenever, you know, shoes on the other foot. But uh, that's good. You know, as long as they're giving honor to each other, they're not going to have any problems. I mean, she's going to think the utmost to him. She's going to think, boy, the Lord's been good to me. Give me a man like that. He's going to say, man, the Lord's been good to me. Man, God's been good to me. Give me a woman like that. Loves God. Loves the Word of God. Loves Jesus. Loves me. I don't have to worry about her. Witnesses on the job. Reads her Bible. Oh, that's good. That's good. That thing says, Given honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. Well, how's she weaker? You say she's physically weaker. Well, that may be true and may not. Now, I've seen a lot of fellows get out there, you know, and they get busy laying some bricks. And, you know, you get, uh, you get down in Florida to get work, and you're going to have to learn to handle that stuff, man. I mean, they don't call them cement blocks. They don't call them cement blocks. They call them bricks. They say, I said, well, got coming up next, boss. Man, I says, uh, well, we're going to go down and lay up. We're going to go lay some jumbo bricks. <laughs> they just call them jumbo bricks, and they handle them like bricks. They take a big old cement block, you know, and, and I, when I was taught, I was taught to keep both feet planted on the ground, keep yourself balanced so you don't hurt your back, and reach around like a pendulum, you know, pick up that block, and have everything set nice and level there, and set that block in line, and take that mud off there, and smack that thing on that side, and take it off this side, and smack it on that side, and, and just move on down, and just go like a ball one after another, and, uh, you know, two hands. Down in Florida, you never cut the mustard with two hands. I mean, down in Florida, them big old dudes down there, man, they grab them blocks down one hand, pick that thing up, smack, smack, drop that thing in line, pick that thing in one hand, smack, smack, drop that thing in line. I don't know a woman could do that or not. I seen a picture in the paper a while back about a woman bricklayer. I thought, how foolish, how foolish. <laughs> Brother, I've been around them bricklayers for 25 years. I know how they talk. I know how they act. You got guys out there. I mean, I went to Madison Baptist College the other day. They're working on that building out there, working around the front entrance there. And uh, a young lady walked out, and I was going out to college there, and, and a young lady stopped to talk to me. And her back was turned, and don't you know them two rascals stood there and just eyeballed her up one side and down the other? I said, come here now, I'll talk to you here. I mean, Amen. that's what's out there. And I can't imagine a woman wanting to go out there and lay bricks. I don't care for a little bit of bricks. I don't care what they are. I can't imagine a woman even wanting to be in that kind of environment. But you know when a woman bears a child... They say she goes as through as much. They say, now, I mean, I never have, you know, so I'm only passing on what I have heard. Uh, they say a woman bears as much, goes through as much physically in bearing a child as anything a man ever goes through. So it may not have to do with physical, although probably to some extent. I don't consider them as, as physically capable as a man. I mean, their muscles are not, just, they're just not made up like a man's muscles are made up. And I don't consider them that strong as what a man is. But some areas they do have as much physical ability as what a man does. But there's other ways in which they're weaker, definite ways in which they're weaker. They're weaker emotionally. Generally speaking, I'm not talking about some situations. Uh, you might have a situation where a woman's stronger than what a man is emotionally. But the general rule of thumb is that emotionally, a woman is not as strong as what a man is. And you're going to have to bear with that. You're going to have to give honor unto her in spite of the fact that she just cries around and she gets worried and she cries over this and she cries over that and something else and she just, she just weakens when a man doesn't weaken. Take your Bible and I'll show you how it goes, generally speaking, on the Word of God. Go to Mark chapter 5 and verse number 33. Mark 5 and verse number 33. 
Mark chapter 5, verse number 33. And I'll read you a couple of verses there. It's the woman that touched the hem of his garment. And, of course, he was healed of the plague there. And verse number 32, and he looked round about, that's Jesus, to see, that, see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. Now, that's typical as far as women are concerned. They get afraid easily, so he says, if you want to show your husband something, show him you're not afraid of every little thing. Show him you're only afraid of one thing, the Lord Jesus Christ. You're afraid of God. That's all. You're afraid to step outside of one thing that God would have you do. You wouldn't do one thing that the Lord wouldn't want you to do. And show him that's the only thing you're afraid of. Because generally, uh, they fear and they tremble. All right, now, one more verse. And at the mouth of truth through witness, let our fact be established. So we pick up another one, Isaiah 19, verse number 16. Isaiah chapter 19, verse number 16. Isaiah 19 and verse number 16. In that day shall Egypt be like unto women. All right, then what are women like? Similitude, so I'm going to show you similitude. So then it has to be just exactly how women are. All right, what is it? And shall it shall be afraid and fear because of the shaking of the hand of the Lord of hosts, which he shaketh over it. Then the typical thing as far as women are concerned is that they are afraid and fear. And so that's natural. And if a woman, if your wife weakens emotionally, when you don't weaken and you just still keep on giving honor unto her and realize that that's just the rule of the thumb. A woman is not as secure as a man is. She's going to worry about the insurance. She's going to worry about the job. A man says, ah, I made it for 25 years. I'll make it 25 more. I mean, I can handle myself. And everybody wants to go around holding Pop's hand. I mean, uh, the girls, they all want to hold Pop's hand. all worry about Pop. And Pop's 87 years of age. He ain't going to let anybody hold his hand. <laughs> I mean, he can make it. He's going to keep on making it. He's still wanting to drive his car. He ain't about to turn back. He's still got hopes, man. He can see very good out of this side, twice as good as he can out of this side. And he's going to the doctor tomorrow with hopes he can get out and drive his car a little bit. That's Pop. But you know, the girls, I mean, they ain't half as old as what Pop is. And they're all worried about Pop. And they're all afraid about Pop. And they're all afraid about Mom. And they're all, you know, that's typical, see? Where a man says, I can make it. I've made it. I know I can make it. And they feel like they can make it. They're secure. They know what it's like to get out there and beat their head against the wall. They've got through before. And uh, so they're going to go on. But a woman, she's going to get all uptight about stuff. We never had insurance for 20 years, my wife and I. That as far as Blue Cross is concerned. I think we had about maybe a one or two months there in 20 years. And uh, when I first got saved, I, I talked to Brother Henniger about it. And he gave me some advice, and I didn't listen to it. He told me to get it. The Lord did get me safely through. And I'm real glad about it. I had a couple little incidents, maybe a couple $300 in 20 years. And I realize yet, as far as a Christian's concerned, I mean, my body's no different than anybody else's body. It's going to get old, and it's going to fall apart, and uh, everything else is going to happen to it that happens to other people's bodies, unless Jesus is merciful to me. I, I realize I could be, uh, I mean, I could be cleaned out in one shot. And so the fellows, they thought I ought to get some insurance, and um, I, we heard about this place out in North Carolina, Blue Cross down there, and I think it was $86 a month. Man, get it. You're not going to get any cheaper. And, and so we got insurance. But you know, my wife kept after me, I guess, the last five years. She's kept asking me to get insurance. Get insurance. You better get some insurance. We don't have anything. Well, I don't have nothing. I don't have no dollars. I got a house. That's all I've got. And uh, anyhow, uh, we finally got it. But I never worried about that thing. I never lost no sleep over it. And Bruce McDowell put me on something one time. He said, uh, he said I like to have insurance. I said, Brother Art, I like to have it. But he says, I don't have the money to get it. And so he says, I must not need it. And I mean, he just simply trusts in God. And because he don't have uh, the money for it, he says, I must not need it. So I just... I said, sounds good to me. So I never lost any sleep about it. My wife, she just worried about it, worried about it, worried about it. Well, because she's made up that way, I mean, after all, she's taken out a man, so she's not as secure as what a man is. Because she's made that way, there's no reason for you to give dishonor to that woman. You give honor unto her. Even if she is weaker emotionally, you give honor to that woman. And there's one more way she's definitely weaker. Take your Bible and go back to First Peter, First Timothy now. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter number 2, look at verse number 11 to 15. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11 to 15. Now, another way, she's definitely weaker. 11, let the women learn silence with all subjection. wonder why we keep hitting that. Like the Bible says in Proverbs, study to be quiet. Man, I, I'd work on that one. Let the women learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man. It's not that you can't teach women, it's over the man. You get that thing? 
over the man, there's where the problem is. Uh, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Wow, there it is again. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived. Now here's the verse. Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. All right, then the rule of thumb is a woman can be easier deceived spiritually than a man can be deceived. Adam wasn't deceived. Eve was deceived. Adam ate the forbidden fruit because Adam loved his wife and she wanted somebody to die for and he did and he died. And so every woman wants somebody that, I mean, some women want you to quit on God for their sake, just like uh, Adam did for Eve. I wouldn't do that. I'd die for him. I laid down my life for him, but I wouldn't die spiritually for him. No way. Huh. Uh-uh. Uh, anyhow, Adam was not deceived. Eve was deceived, being the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they, well, they, that's husband and wife, if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. And you know, you don't just get married because you're free from mom and daddy. Apron strings are cut now. Go out and live like the devil. Uh -uh. Never in a million years. Saved in childbearing doesn't have to do with salvation of your soul. Saved in childbearing has to do with saved from deception. Like Eve was deceived with the result being found back in 1 John chapter 3 and verse number 12. And if you want to. Give honor unto your wife as under the weaker vessel. You better acknowledge the fact that she can be deceived. The devil deceive her so very easily. And you better guard her with a passion. And you better keep her around the preaching the word of God. You better keep everything above board yourself so she has no reason uh, to resent your authority or the authority of the word of God. All Satan did was very subtly get her to despise the authority of the word of God. Yea, hath God said. And all Satan has to do in your life is get your wife to despise the authority of the Word of God because of your life and your attitude and your way you uh, conduct yourself around that home. And women don't like that authority, but if they're godly, they'll be in subjection to your authority. But you better keep everything else in order, realizing they can be deceived. And things says it's being heirs together of the grace of life. Heirs together. I mean, it's so good, man, to see a husband and wife team. I think over there at Madison Baptist College, I see some of those students and their wives are in there. And, man, I'm glad they are. Because that fellow's going to need some help. He's going to need somebody to type for him. He's going to need somebody to, I mean, to, to do things for him. And, I mean, I'm glad for him. Being heirs together, the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Uh, last of all, make sure that you pray with them. Make sure that you spend time praying with them. That your prayer, not just yours yourself, that your prayers, that's both of you, heirs together the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. You ever notice how hard it is to pray whenever you got problems in the home? You ever notice when things aren't going very well, you, you get down and pray and there's, not, there's like a barrier there, like a block there, like a shield there. You ever notice that? I don't like it. I don't like it. I hate it. I like to get down and pray and say, Lord, you're so good. And Lord, I, I love you. And Lord, I want to I want to I want to get out of your road, Lord. And I, I hate pride and I hate myself. And and Lord, you're just so good. You're so good. I like it that way. I want to be heirs together. I want to I want to I want to love life. I want to have a I want to have a lovely home and a lovely home is going to take wife and it's going to take husband and it's going to take both of them fitting the Word of God right down to the T. And when you got that, you've got something. You know what you got? You got a touch of heaven on this earth. Maybe you don't have it tonight. Maybe you're here tonight and you don't have that. You couldn't say that about yours. Well, you can't have. And I don't know, I don't know your problems. I don't want to ask people. I don't prior run, I don't bird dog people, I don't go out your home and just try to find all the fault I can, I go on for a blessing, I'm going to go and eat your candy, I'm going to go and eat your apples, I'm going to go and drink your cider, I'm going to go and eat your pizza, I'm, a, I'm not out there bird dog in every situation I see, I'm not going to do it, not going to do it, you know, and if God's put something on you tonight, then 
let's just turn it around and go buy the book for a change. Now remember, here's women, and women, according to the Word of God, you can win your husbands to obedience to the Word of God by your chaste conversation coupled with fear and the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. Husbands, remember, that woman's weaker in some areas. Remember, you're to give honor to that woman. Remember, uh, you're supposed to dwell with them according to knowledge. Give an honor unto them. And pray with them. Don't ever quit praying with those women. Let's bow for prayer. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, I thank you for the word of God. And Lord, this is not how I planned things to go tonight, but it's all right. It doesn't have to be like I planned it. Lord, I realize I can't always be yelling at them and preaching to them. Sometimes I just need instructed. and Sometimes I just need encouraged. Sometimes I just need edified. And sometimes things need corrected. Now, Lord, I pray whatever the need is here. Lord, I pray your spirit would put it on these folks. And Lord, you can do better than I can do it anyhow. And so I ask you to, to, to work in their hearts. And Father, we yield to you. We're nobody, Lord. We're just somebody living in a no-good-for-nothing vessel of clay and the devil fighting us on every hand. And God, we ask you to to work us over by your word. And we want to be submissive unto you. Lord, I, I'm just praying I'd have some happy homes around here. Lord, I pray that I wouldn't have one, two, five, or ten. But Lord, I pray that every home in this, in this congregation, Lord, would be just happy and tremendous homes. Lord, where you're uh, given honor and where you have a place. And where people are happy and joyful and just rejoice in the goodness of God. And Lord, it can be theirs if they'll go by the book. And I ask these things in Jesus' name with thanksgiving. Amen. Okay, I'd like to ask you to stand. I'm not even going to give an invitation.